Hey guys, King Razzle here, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most anticipated games of the year, Dishonored 2. This game is going to be releasing on November the 11th, and this episode is hopefully going to get you up to speed on some of the information that we have on the game up to this point, and to help you determine if it's one you're interested in or not. Also, if you've not played Dishonored 1, then there are going to be quite a few spoilers in this video, so just be aware of that. And uh, with all that said, let's go ahead and kick this off with the story of the game. The story of the game begins 15 years after the events of the first Dishonored game. Emily Caldwin is now the Empress of the Empire of Isles, taking over for her mother who was assassinated in the first game. However, on the 15th anniversary of the death of the Empress, an otherworldly usurper to the throne appears and takes the throne from Emily. This causes Emily and her father-slash-protector, Corvo Latano, the protagonist from the first game, to travel to the city of Karnaka to unravel this conspiracy and restore Emily to the throne. Along with that information, we also know that the character known as the Outsider will be returning in this game, and we also know quite a bit of information about the backstory of Karnaka the city. And in my opinion, more importantly, we know that the game will again be featuring multiple endings as stated by the co-creative director, Harvey Smith, who confirmed that the game will have more than two endings and will have several different states for those endings, depending on whether the player achieved very high, high, or low chaos during their playthrough. Outside of that, we don't know much about the story, but there is one main thing that I think is relatively safe to assume given its presence in the trailer and that it's the identity of the usurper to the throne. We see in several different screenshots that the person's name is actually Delilah Caldwin, as in the family of the Empress. So I think it's safe to assume that she comes into the picture and claims to be the rightful heir to the throne. However, I don't know how she's going to substantiate these claims. That's pretty much anyone's guess. I'd say it's probably either going to be by saying that Emily is actually the imposter and that she, Delilah, is the daughter of both the former Empress and someone maybe more fitting than Corvo. I don't know who that would be, because to my knowledge, the Empress didn't have any other lovers besides Corvo, but that's just a hypothesis. So then Emily and Corvo will go in search of information that will somehow give them the evidence that Delilah is the imposter as opposed to Emily, but that's all just speculation. Dishonored 2 is going to be an action-adventure stealth game in the same vein as the first title. The major difference here is going to be that there's going to be in the inclusion of a second character in Emily Caldwin. At the start of the game, you'll be playing as Emily Caldwin, and then a little bit in, you're going to be given the choice to choose between either Emily or Corvo. Corvo's moveset remains largely the same as the first game, but Emily's moveset is all new with different abilities that are exclusive to her. You could choose to play the game as you like, either killing everyone that gets in your way or being a more conscious killer and pretty much just sparing everyone. The way you play will determine how the story ends with your killing contributing to your chaos levels, which determine how happy your ending will be. There are also going to be multiple ways to perform each mission, so you can choose to eliminate enemies in a lethal or non-lethal way, and that again is going to contribute to your chaos levels. The main draw of this game are the abilities bestowed upon your character. As stated, each character has a specific moveset that is exclusive to that character, so let's go ahead and talk about Corvo's confirmed moves first, since they're basically the same as the first game. First of all, we have the ability Bend Time, which is pretty self-explanatory. It allows you to stop time for a short duration. Next, we have the Possession ability, which is, again, pretty self-explanatory. The ability allows you to assume control of a host for a short amount of time. It should also be noted that this host does not have to be a human, so you can jump into a bug, I think is what they showed. And in the first game, I seem to remember a lot of time spent being a rat. Next, we have the ability Chain Host, which basically just allows you to jump from one host into the other to avoid detection. Next, we have the Redirective Blink ability, which is sort of a piggyback off the Blink ability, which allows you to teleport short distances. The Redirective Blink ability, however, allows you to stop time as you use the Blink ability, which allows for easier setups. Lastly, we have the Wind Blast ability, which is a gust of wind, which can be used to shatter doors or deflect projectiles, and in this instance, send enemies flying. These were the abilities specifically outlined in the Player's Corvo section of the Desperate Escapes trailer, which can be found in the description below. Along with these abilities, we also know that the Devouring Swarm ability will be returning, as it can be seen in Corvo's gameplay trailer, which can be found in the description below as well. Next up, we have Emily, whose abilities are brand new and thus much more interesting. First up, we have the Shadow Walk ability. The description given for this ability is to assume a stealthier form, but what it appears to do is allow Emily to move very low to the ground and move very quickly. 
Presumably, this will allow Emily to move much quicker and much more quietly towards an enemy so as to sneak up on them for the kill. Next up, we have the Doppelganger ability, which allows you to summon a shade of yourself that will attract enemies. This ability creates a double of yourself which seems capable of killing enemies and also draws enemies' attention. Next up, we have the Dark Vision ability, which allows you to see living beings through walls. This ability was in the first game and was part of Corvo's arsenal, so I don't know if that means it's going to be exclusive to Emily, but it is being shown for her and not for Corvo, so who knows. Next up, we have the Mesmerize ability, which summons a Void Spirit to enthrall humans or hounds. This ability seems to be a way of making enemies oblivious to your presence by making them stare into an object if they are in range of the ability. Next up, we have the Far Reach ability, which allows you to pull yourself rapidly across a distance. This is basically a counter to Corvo's Blink ability. It's not exactly the same as you don't disappear, so I assume enemies could potentially still do damage to you as you travel, and it doesn't appear to stop time, so you'll need to be more precise with your movements whenever you use it. Next, we have the Transposition ability, which allows you to swap places with your Doppelganger. This ability plays off the use of the Doppelganger ability and allows you to go where they are and vice versa. Finally, we have the Domino ability, which allows you to link targets so they all share the same fate. Basically, you'll be selecting multiple enemies, and then if you kill one of the enemies or knock them out, then all the enemies that have been selected with that ability will also die or be knocked out. These were the abilities outlined in the Play as Emily section of the Daring Escapes trailer. We've seen a lot of gameplay for Emily, so it's possible that I may have missed something in here, so let me know in the comments below if I did. As with the previous game, you'll also be able to upgrade these abilities, but this time around you're going to have a new depth to that system and a skill tree, allowing for more customization. Aside from that, the city of Karnaka will also play into how you play the game. As opposed to Dunwall, Karnaka was designed with the idea of more verticality. This means that you'll be able to scour the rooftops more effectively than you could in Dishonored 1. Karnaka also has the weather condition of being very windy and this is known to kick up dust storms, which will inhibit your enemies from spotting you and provide you some cover. Finally, the city is prone to hatching of insects, which are called blood flies, and you can see them in various videos. They are this game's version of the rat plague, which was important in the first game, and these insects, they hatch from corpses and they can alter gameplay somewhat. Some other announcements that I'd like to touch on would be that there's going to be a system for crafting your own bone charms, which can offer character buffs. Uh, there's going to be a device which allows you to go back and forth in time, even though I think that was tied to a particular mission. It was pretty interesting. They showed it off at E3. Your base of operations this time around is going to be the ship, the Dreadful Whale, uh, which will be your base in between levels and allow you to purchase items and upgrade your gear. And finally, you can choose to play the whole entire game without using any super supernatural powers, should that be your wish, which to me kind of defeats the point of this. But, you know, if that's something that sounds fun to you, that is possible. For systems, the game is coming out on the PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4, and will be releasing November 11th, 2016. The game has two editions that I'm aware of, those being the Standard Edition and the Premium Collector's Edition. With the Standard Edition, pre-ordering the game will get you a digital copy of the original Dishonored game, the Definitive Edition, on your console of choice, as well as access to the Imperial Assassin's Pack, which comes with two bone charms, Duelist's Luck and Void Favor, as well as the lore book, A Musician's Farewell, an antique Zirconian guitar, and 500 coins for the illegal black market shop, which I assume is going to be the shop on the boat. With the Collector's Edition, you'll be getting all the stuff in the picture, as well as everything mentioned above. Plus, pre-ordering will apparently allow you to play the game one day early. Typically, I'd say that pre-ordering isn't worth it, but if you plan on getting this day one anyways, like I do, without pre-ordering, I say go ahead and pre-order it because basically you're getting the entire first game for free. Uh, I think it's at $20 right now, but you're pre basically getting that for free, and that just seems like a really good deal to me, So, if you, especially if you haven't played the first game. So if you plan on getting this one and you haven't played the first game, or you just want to go back through the first game, then I would probably say pre-order it because it seems like a good deal. For my personal thoughts on the game, there is nothing that I've seen about this game that has made me wary of it. That's not to say that it's not going to have any issues or anything like that. It's just that everything I've seen or read on the game, I've liked for this being a follow-up to Dishonored. Uh, personally, I wasn't a big fan of Dishonored, as I think a lot of people were. If I was reviewing it, honestly, I'd probably give it around an 8. It had some great concepts, but I don't think it fleshed everything out as well as it could have. 
Uh, with this game, they seem to have expanded a lot on the general concepts of the first game, which is all that I really wanted to see out of it. There will be the inclusion of another character in Emily, whose abilities look very fun, as well as the expansion of customization of abilities, which I also look forward to. The world will be steeped in history. I think the Karnaka video said that they're going to have two centuries of backstory, or that's what they were building the bases off of, which I think is a great way to build atmosphere in a game. So uh, I'm excited about that and flesh out the world. Uh, they also include more endings based around the chaos level of your game, which is something that I appreciated about the first game. And the story seems to be interesting. It seems to be involved around some mystery as to who this usurper is, and I think it, I think it has potential. Top that off with gameplay that looks very fun and creative combat combinations. Not to mention that the replayability with the entire story being replayable with either Corvo or Emily, whose abilities are unique from the outset, and it, it just looks like a very promising game. The only thing that I could really even nitpick if I was going to nitpick about something would be the graphics, which I personally don't think look that great, but that's pretty much all that <laughs> I can even nitpick about it. But anyways, guys, that's pretty much everything that I have to say about this game. I hope I was able to give you some information about this game to help you gauge if this is a title that you're interested in or not. I do plan on doing a full review of this game once I've gotten my hands on it. If you're interested in that, then be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. The next coming soon episode that I plan on doing will be for Pokemon Sun and Moon, which will be coming out on the 18th of this month. The game comes out November 18th. Uh, anyways, guys, uh, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next video.